Yeah, it's fine now. Yeah. Shall we try it again with the screen share to make sure it works for playing? Yeah, let's go for it. Um, Becky, do you, you could, maybe if you keep this going, but if you stop your screen share and just let Suda sure. open hers up. Yeah. Uh, right, am I being really dumb? How do I do it? If she's ready to, if she's ready to start. I'll stop share. <laughs> yeah. Sure you go. got it. All right, yeah. I'll share it. All right, do you see it? See your slides? Yeah. Um, let's see. on movie all right so this guy is giving me trouble still let me just try the next one so that okay. i can just fix this while uh, you're waiting for the there's a new one i just put in uh yeah it's working <laughs> Yay! Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the rest of the movies are uh, okay. I just take them. So. Do you know what you did differently so that if this happens in the future, we can tell people what to do? I think some of the media is not quite compatible with PowerPoint, so I just have to reinsert it. Yeah. Okay. So the problem was basically like with with your slides, not with Zoom. I don't think it's with Zoom, yeah. Okay, that's I think helpful. some of it needed to be formatted, right? And it was formatted, but somehow just did not work anymore. So I would be inserted. All right, perfect. All right, we'll just, we'll let, um, if you want to stop the screen share, if you've checked mm -hmm. your movies, we'll let Becky put up her, um, her thing to figure out where we're all from uh, just for one minute before we get started. Cool. Maybe we can start a couple of minutes after the hour, Jen, just so give people a little time yeah just maybe like a couple of minutes it's like one pass or two passes on it the, the instructions are short now right <laughs> i don't know we'll see wow a hundred percent that can't be right there's no human cells on here that's, that's not fair Becky hates humans. <laughs> Where's all the C. elegans people? Oh, there you go. <laughs> Where's There's at least one somewhere. <laughs> Where's Dick Distelium? <laughs> Next week, we'll... we'll yeah, uh... where is Dick T? <laughs> oh, feeling a little bad for the organisms nobody likes. To be fair, I guess it makes sense that there's no Arabidopsis people in some migration. <laughs> yeah, if anything, they're control organisms here. Well, I just, I, I answered Drosophila because I like to read Drosophila papers, but I've never actually done a fly experiment. Ooh. I know. Controversial, okay. very something. <laughs> I work with human cells. What do you want from me? <laughs> yeah. but yeah i guess if you just wrote human as model organism people might start to worry about us yeah we might go viral for the wrong reasons <laughs> becky can i see the city screen again of course you can bear with me oh there you go oh, oh wow. Baltimore. i'd like to hear more about who lives inside of drosophila <laughs> me too
Was that you, Jen? <laughs> like, me? No. I don't think you love Buffalo that much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really live in Boston, but I think if I wrote Sharon, Massachusetts, that um, nobody else would pick that. So this is by word it is. What city are you based in so that people have a bit more um, freedom? Should we get started, Jen? Just a couple of minutes. Yeah. Let's go cool. ahead. Cool. I'll stop sharing. Okay, great. All right, so hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our sixth installment of the Cell Migration Seminar Series. Um, a quick reminder to everyone that uh, the Zoom link is going to be the same each week. So pin the link or the email, and even if you don't get the weekly emails, if it goes to your spam or something, you'll just be able to come to this link uh, at this time and, and be able to uh, see the talks. And we're scheduled out through the end of August. We'll be sharing that soon. So um, same time, same place each week. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, we're really excited today to be hosting two PhD students and one postdoc. Uh, so it's sort of our trainee special. Um, as a reminder, at the end of the talk, please type your question into the chat or type the word question and we'll call on you and we encourage uh, people to do that to make it a little bit more interactive. Um, at the end of each talk, we're all going to unmute our microphones, give the speaker a real round of applause. Um, so to try to keep everything on time, let's go ahead and uh, dive right in. So our first speaker will be Cecilia. I'll let you uh, or I'll let her give her um, full uh, name introduction. She's a second year PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, in Dr. Irene Yan's lab. Her research focuses on vertebrate eye morphogenesis and chick and mouse embryos. And using live imaging approaches in vivo, she analyzes the dynamics of epithelial cell movements during early lens formation. So uh, go ahead, Cecilia, and take it away. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Erin. Thanks for the introduction. And I would like to thank this incredible opportunity and thank the organizers for uh, the seminar. It has all been great. So uh, my name is Cecilia Magalhães. I'm a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And my advisor is Professor Dr. Irene Young. And I'm going to show uh, today some results about the surface epithelial cells of the chick embryo. So uh, we are all familiar with the adult eye, which has the complex anatomy, different kinds of tissues. So for example, we have here the cornea and the lens to transparent tissues that are responsible to direct the rays of the light into, uh, into the eye. And we form a focus image here on the retina. So this complex shape, which is crucial for the eye function, it comes from a series of morphogenic events that begins with the evagination of the optic vesicle from the mirror tube. So here we have the mirror tube and it's a specific portion that calls the encephalon. It, uh, the optic vesicle evaginates, and then when it evaginates, it gets in contact, it interacts with the surface epithelia. So later in development, the optic vesicle will form the retina, so the sensory portion of the eye, and the surface epithelia will form the cornea, the lens, and other structures. So another important morphogenic event during the early eye development is the invagination of the lens placard. So here I'm going to show a series of, morphog of morphological sections. So we are going to see histological sections from chick embryo to analyze this invagination process. So here we have uh, the chick embryo at the anterior portion. Here in this dorsal view of the histological section, we can see the mirror tube, the optic vesicles evaginating, and here uh, outside the, the surface epithelia. So here we can see the optic vesicle evaginate, it interacts with the surface epithelia, and in a specific portion of the surface epithelia, we can see the lens placard formation, and then it evaginates. And following this invagination process, the optic vesicle bends together to form the optic cup. So here is a, an schematic representation of this, those events. So here we have the optic vesicle, the surface epithelia, the lens placard formation by those six cells, and then we have the invagination process. So uh, most of the studies focus on this uh, lens placardo development and invagination process that the optic cup um, bending together. So uh, here we are interested in something that has always been implicit about those epithelial cells that surround the lens placardo invagination. So uh, those cells that surround the lens placardo invagination, we are calling them as peripacodo cells, and they have to follow the invagination movement to close the tissue above the lens vesicle after it's completely invaginated. 
So um, our aim here is to understand the behavior of those specific epithelial cells, the group of caudal cells, during this uh, very intense morphogenic event, which is uh, the lens plaque or the invagination. And we are going to understand the behavior of those epithelial cells by comparing them with other epithelial cells, they are not involved uh, in a uh, enhanced morphogenic movement. So they are in a less dynamic context. So to do this, we electroporated the cells from uh, the epithelium of the chicago with membrane GFP. So then we can see the entire membrane of the cell labeled by the green fluorescent protein. And here we can see a uh, schematic representation of the chicago at stage 15. And we can see that the lens plaque during the invagination, they have this uh, kind of done it uh, shape. And here the cells that surround the lens plaque of the invagination are the pupil caudal cells. So here in this image, we are looking at the apical surface of the cell. So here is our objective looking at the apical surface. And here we can see the lens feet, which is the center of the lens plaque of the invagination, the lens plaque by those very integrated cells. And surrounding this tissue, following this invagination movement, we have the pupil caudal cells. And here in this movie, we can see the movement of those cells. And here it's important to say that we have correct the drift of the embryo. So we're not looking at the movement of the embryo, but we are looking at the movement of the tissue. So here we can see that those cells, they move in the direction of the lens placard, uh, center invagination. And also what uh, was, was really surprised to us, it really caught us our attention, was that uh, there is a lot of protrusion emission. So there is a really rich, an intense activity of protrusion emission by those cells. So we can see a lot of extension and retraction movement. So this was, was really interesting to see. And unlike the classical representation of uh, epithelia where we have cuboidal cells very similar to each other with a high symmetry between all the axes of the cells, we can see by this 3D reconstruction that the purple caudal cells, they are not cuboidal at all. So this epithelia is not cuboidal. We do not see this uh, high symmetry. And also by this 3D reconstruction, we can see that those protrusions, they are emitted in all the phases of the cell. So we can see protrusions being emitted in the apical phase, in the lateral phase, and also in the basal phase of the cell. So it was really, really interesting also. And we did the same thing with other epithelial cells. So we electroporated the epithelial cells from, for example, here is an image of the dorsal cephalic region of the chick embryo. And we can see the expression of the membrane GFP here. And just like the peripacodal cells, those other epithelial cells also show intense activity of protrusion emission. However, unlike the peripacodal cells, those cells, they, they do not seem to move a lot. They seem to stay in the same place during uh, the entire live imaging experiment. And so our first question was just about this movement. So our hypothesis was that since the peripacodal cells are close to this invagination movement of the lens placard, maybe uh, they move faster. And indeed, when we quantify this movement, we can see that the speed of the cell displacement of peripacodal cells is uh, higher than in other epithelial cells. So the peripacodal cells, they move faster than other epithelial cells. And uh, from now, we I'm going to show a set of measurements to see if those really fun structures that are the protrusions, if their dynamics and their characters match to the characters of those two populations of cells. So first we quantify the number of protrusions that are uh, being emitted from those cells uh, to see if there is any difference of the number of protrusions. And when we analyze this, we can see in this graph that the number of protrusions of peripacodal cell uh, emitted in a 10 minute interval is very similar to other epithelial cells. So we do not see uh, a difference in the number of protrusions. So both cells, peripacodal cells and epithelial cells, they uh, emit the same, a similar number of protrusions over the same period. And our next question, so, okay, the number of protrusions is not different, but what if the protrusions themselves are different from one population to another? So we ask about the length of the protrusions and we can see in orange that the frequency in peripacodal cells the higher frequency is in the short protrusion. So most of the peripacodal protrusions are shorter compared to other epithelial cells. And we can see this by the median here also. So uh, a representation of this results, we can see that peripacodal cells, most of the protrusions are shorter compared to other epithelial cells where we have longer cells. So our next question was about the dynamic, the stability of those protrusions. 
So periplacodal cells are shorter in length. And what about their half-life? What about their stability? So we quantify the duration of each protrusion and, or you can say the half-life of each protrusion. For example, here, this protrusion, uh, it extends and it quickly retracts. So uh, it has been there for four frames. The short protrusion has been there for two frames, so it's less stable. And we quantify this and compare the periplacodal with other epithelial protrusions. We can see that both short and long protrusions from the two populations, these periplacodal protrusions are less stable. So the half-life of periplacodal protrusions is shorter compared to other epithelial cells. So in a schematic representation of these results, we can see that periplacodal cells, they extend the protrusion and they quickly retract, while other epithelial cells, they extend the protrusion and the protrusion stay there for a longer time. So the protrusion seems to be uh, more stable compared to periplacodal protrusion. So, okay, we have uh, all these measurements, all these characteristics about the protrusions, but we still we have a lot of open questions about their function. So are they, what they, are they doing there in the epithelial surface of each table? Are they associated with traction? Are they they're generating any kind of force in the tissue? Are they uh, associated with the intercellular communication? And if we investigate uh, more about the CT skeleton composition of the protrusions, maybe we can understand more uh, about their function. So our first question was about the cell traction. So maybe if the protrusions are associated with, any, uh, with generating any kind of force, they would have a specific direction. So we measured the direction of the periplacodal protrusion, and we associated this with the uh, link cycle of invagination movement. So here we can see the, all the angles of protrusions being emitted, and we set as then go here the center of the length invagination. And we can see that uh, there is no clear specific direction of the periplacodal protrusion. And also we did the same thing with other epithelial cells. However, here we put at angry angle zero an arbitrary reference point, and we can see that also there is no specific direction of this protrusion. And about the interstellar communication, what we saw was a very uh, interesting phenomenon, which is, beautiful, is really beautiful to watch, which is the membrane puncture trafficking through those protrusions. So here I'm going to show a few movies, and here there are two periplacodal cells, those two ones. And, I'll, uh, and please pay attention to this protrusion here. You are going to see a membrane puncture trafficking through this protrusion. It, it's really, really fun to watch. Okay, there it is. And uh, in those two uh, periplacodal cells also, uh, there is this very long protrusion that seems to be interconnecting this cell with this other cell. And we are going to see by the green arrow um, a, a really small membrane puncture trafficking through those protrusions, through this protrusion, sorry. Yeah. Okay, and in other epithelial cell, we saw a very similar phenomenon. So in the bottom of this move, we are going to see a membrane puncture inside one protrusion, and here in the, in the top of the video, we can see another one. So we can see that in this epithelia, there is a lot of things going on. It's a very active epithelia, and there's a, a, a lot of things to study. And about the cytoskeleton composition of these structures, so here we have a challenge, a difficulty in our system. We try different kinds of methods to try to fix those structures and to maintain the entire length of the protrusion and the entire number, this high number of protrusions that are received per cell. However, we did not find a successful method. And so what we did, we accessed a tubulin GFD, so we exported the, the, the embryo with tubulin GFD and coupling to those GFD. So with tubulin, we can see the, the label of microtubes, and with coupling, we can see portion of the actin filament. And here is the tubulin expression, so it's a live imaging also. We can see a few very long protrusions labeled by tubulin, so there is microtubes in here and a short one. However, we do not see the same pattern as we used to see with the membrane GFD expression. And here with coupling expression, we can see portions of protrusions labeled by the coupling, and most of them, they, are, uh, they, they label the base of those protrusions. And with both, we do not see the pattern of the membrane GFD expression. So it suggests that maybe we have a heterogeneous population of periplacodal protrusion. So uh, our closing remarks are that the surface epithelial cells, they are not cuboidal at all. They do not have this high symmetry. 
and uh, they emit a lot of protrusion, so they have this really rich activity. They have this intercellular trafficking between one cell to another. And near morphogenic points, and here we are looking at pericocodal cells that surround the lens plaque divagination, the cells move faster, and the protrusions are shorter, and they are less stable compared to other stereo cells. So uh, my take-home message, I would like to say that the embryonic surface epithelia is a very convenient and cool experimental system to study cell biology. So I would like to thank uh, everyone uh, for listening to me. I thank very much the organizers for this incredible opportunity. I'd like to thank my lab, uh, especially Professor Dr. Irene Young. I also like to thank Professor Dr. Shantar from Oxford University uh, for his collaboration, which has been crucial for our work. I'd like to thank Dr. Mario Cruz, uh, which is from our microscopic facility our, at our beautiful university in Sao Paulo. And I would like to thank, thank CAPIS funding um, and capacity and CNPK. And here's my email and my Twitter. And please feel free to contact me, to send me any ideas. If you want to discuss something, uh, it would be awesome. And I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank Thanks, you. Cecilia. Thank Everybody you. unmute and let's clap. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so actually, I wanted to uh, use my moderator privileges and start with um, and ask the first question myself. Um, so I'm really fascinated to see these epithelial cells that really don't look like epithelial cells. And I was just wondering, are there is there some uh, partial EMT going on? Is there expression of mesenchymal markers? And then as a follow up to that, do they eventually become what we think of as a typical epithelium once they settle down and stop moving? Um, so I'd just love to hear a little more about that. that that's a great question. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, well, we it, it would be very interesting to label some uh, proteins to analyze any polarization of the cells to see if it's a collective migration also, and to see if they uh, have uh, this uh, epithelial to mesenchyme transition that it talked about. Uh, for sure, we are going to do this in the future. And we were really surprised as well to see that uh, it, it's not, it doesn't look like a epithelial at all. So when we see the 3D, um, the, the 3D reconstruction, we can see that those cells, they're not the cuboidal cells. And in other epithelials uh, as well, I did not show the 3D reconstruction in other epithelial cells, but these other epithelial cells in the echo surface, they seem to have uh, a symmetry However, when we look at the 3D reconstruction, we can see that they are not. Uh, we have a question from Greg Emery, who's asking, uh, could it be that the protrusions that display intercellular trafficking are actually tunneling nanotubes or cytonemes? Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. And uh, so the cytonemes is a specialized philopodia that is specialized in, in signaling uh, molecules and uh, is associated with morphogens and everything. So we will have to see what they are trans uh, what they are uh, trafficking between one cell to another. We we'll have to characterize more about those. Uh, what are they uh, transporting? But yes, and also cytonemes have been described in embryos during the lean bud development and in dermomyotum, uh, in the stomach, epithelia, and everything. So it will be very interesting to analyze an other characteristics to say for sure that they are cytomines, but from now I, I cannot sure this. Thanks. All right, we've got a question from uh, Roberto Mayor, if he wants to unmute and bring up his camera. Yeah, uh, hi. Um, so, so, I mean, you, you, you show and you compare the, these protrusions in in two tissues that are very dynamic, which is the neural tube and uh, or the which is going to be the neural tube, or is already the neural tube and the the this preplacosal region or the placosal region, have you compared with other epithelial uh, tissues that uh, are not so dynamic, like epidermis, for example, and to 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 see if that maybe this is something specific that happens in more dynamic epithelium? Yes. And by the way, very nice images. And I know how hard it is to, to generate those in vivo movies in, in Chick. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zet. And thank you for your question. Uh, so this other epithelial cells that I showed, they are all from the surface ectoderm. 
in the head. Most of them is in, in the cephalic area. And we also uh, did a experimental of live imaging near the somites, but still in the surface epithelia, in the exoderm. And at this stage, the neural tube has invaginated already. So they are not close to this uh, tissue shape changes. Uh, so they are all from the surface epithelia that are also from the, the exoderm. Can I ask another question related to that? Yes. I mean, is, is the, are, are you certain that these are not neural crest cells because there are a lot of neural crests moving around in that region, which are very yes. yes, there is. But the neural crest cells, uh, they arrive in this region of the link packet uh, when it's already available. So it, it, the neuro, there are no neural crest cells around the eye at this stage. So they are still more in the cephalic region. Uh, so more, sorry, in the dorsal region. So in the eye, uh, there is no neural crest cells yet. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, question from Abhishek Das. Sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, have you tried to isolate single cells to try and understand the intercellular communication dynamics via such protrusions, for example, lateral inhibition? Wow, yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question and we like to interfere with this protrusion uh, in the future. I, I do not even understand, but it's about the interfering the protrusion, right? Okay, so uh, it's quite difficult to interfere with the, specifically with the protrusions and maintain the, the movement of the link sparkled invagination. Because you see, you had, we had to express the membrane uh, before. So we electroporate the embryo at stage 11. And then if we change the cytoskeleton proteins or any, anything that would uh, will interfere with the protrusion with the filopodial formation, it would interfere with the length cycle invagination. We tried to use a dominant negative form of CDC42, and what we saw was a lot of uh, cell death. So we had to optimize uh, this process and also uh, find a way to interfere only with the protrusions without interfering uh, the tissue shape changes. If you have any ideas, that would be great. All right, thanks. Um, this is going to be this next one will be our last question. Um, we have to move on because we've got all three of you guys today. Um, so Akanshi wants to know, do periplacodal protrusions form tethers with the rest of the epithelium? Maybe tensile forces are more relevant than traction forces. Mm, I, I think you, he asking about uh, the tissue, like all the all the cells together, right, to generate any force. I think specifically if the periplacodal cells are connecting with other epithelial cells is yes. the way I read the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, so yeah, the, all the cells in the embryo, we have the entire tissue. So we do not have uh, single cells migrating as, uh, as, we, as we see, for example, in neural crest cells. So uh, here we use electroporation to, uh, to have this pattern of mosaic and to analyze single cells. However, all the cells are touching each other. So we have an entire tissue and only a few cells are expressing membrane GFC. So then we can observe this protrusion. Without this mosaic system, without this uh, mosaic pattern, we couldn't see, observe this uh, protrusion dynamics. Great, thank you very much, Cecilia. Thank you very much. So our second talk today is from Daniel Bucock. Daniel is a PhD student in the group of Eduard Hanezo at IST Austria. His work focuses on bridging mechanisms of biological pattern formation with design principles underlying function. And today he's going to be talking about the theory of mechanochemical patterning and optimal migration in cell monomers. Hi, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I don't know, actually, one minute. Um, stop that again. Uh, sorry, one minute. Just make... um, 
you know, yeah. if you're having technical problems, should we um, move on and have Suda uh, um, give hers first or? Just one oh, second, I sh should be sharing my screen now. And, um, okay, so are you actually seeing my slides? Are you seeing the? We're uh, seeing the slides, but not in presenter uh, mode. Okay, just one second. You share. Okay, are we good now? Yeah, it looks uh, great. Yeah, yeah, I was having some issues. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, <laughs> so finally, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thanks for having me and everyone who's uh, tuned in. Yeah, so I want to talk about uh, mechanochemical patterning in migrating cell monolayers. And I'm going to start by trying to just sort of descri describe how these patterns can form. And, uh, and then I'm going to move on to sort of discussions of design principles, optimality, and uh, robustness. And hopefully it'll be it could become more clear what I mean by this. Yeah, so our group is sort of interested in general in uh, pattern formation in biological systems, and especially well as sort of a, a mechanochemical coupling. So we were quite interested to see reports of mechanical waves in migrating MDCK uh, monolayers. So here we have a sort of chymograph of this, where um, at time zero, uh, either a wound is made or, or cells are released. And then we see mechanical waves of, of, sort of density propagating away from it, uh, migrating edges towards the bulk of the tissue. And it's kind of surprising, uh, perhaps, to see these persistent waves in, in what should be a dissipated medium. And this sort of uh, might signal that some sort of activity involved. And this could be uh, from sort of a, a purely mechanical activity, such as cell migration. And this might uh, generate sort of instability, driving waves analogous to, for instance, uh, waves seen in migrating herds or in uh, sort of uh, congested traffic. On the other hand, um, we also see accompanying these mechanical waves, uh, chemical waves of here characterized by ERK activity. So this sort of uh, begs the question of whether a coupling between these mechanical waves and chemical waves uh, or mechanical and chemical systems could be driving an instability instead. And so a more general question is, do these, play, uh, do these waves play any role in organizing bulk migration? Because sort of a sort of non-dissipative wave might be quite an efficient means of communicating information about uh, where the boundary is to cells in the bulk so that they can then migrate in this direction. Yeah, so we wanted to, to begin by studying this in, uh, this in the most simple setting that we could find, which was confluent tissues. So here, the tissues are stopped migrating, it's filled space, um, cells are, are unpolarized, yet we still see um, these patterns. And this would seem like a, a good time to introduce our, our collaborators who've done all the experimental work. This is uh, Noya Hino and Tsuyoshi Hiroshima at Koyoto University. Yeah, so in the confluent case, we again, and I hope this is sort of playing smoothly enough, we see disordered uh, sort of isotropic waves, both in density and in ERK, um, which have the same sort of correlations and the same wavelength as, and period as in migrating tissues or, or very similar. So this sort of asks the uh, sort of, uh, sort of leads the question, why do we see these directional waves in migrating tissue? Uh, sort of directional waves when uh, waves are not directed in complement tissue. And we can sort of uh, suspect that this might have something to do with the active migration and polarization. On the other hand, how are these patterns sustained in complement tissue? Um, because it seems like active migration and cell polarization can't be driving this instability. So instead, we sort of um, we sort of had the idea that this could be uh, the patterns could be driven by a coupling between cell density and ERK activity. And so here we have uh, sort of, uh, patterns of ERK and the accompanying uh, plotted in cell cell area, with cell area preceding ERK by some short delay. And a sort of simple uh, sort of model that we could generate for this is that cell shape changes are activating ERK. Uh, with some delay. And then the ERK, ERK activity for its downstream effect on myosin and sort of, uh, cellular tensions is then having a feedback on cell shape and completing this loop. And the sort of experimental evidence for these couplings as well, uh, when cells are stretched, we see the ERK is increased. And also when we activate cells, um, we see that cells contract. And this is forming a sort of activator inhibitor dynamics between ERK activity and the cell length. And we know that activator inhibitor systems generically can form oscillations. So what is the simplest mechanochemical model that we can construct? 
So we, we treat cells as elastic and we couple them. So the tissue is um, sort of a coupled series of overdamped uh, springs. And each, each cell has a preferred rest length, which it would, sort of, it, it would tend towards uh, equilibrium if it was on its own. And this rest length is controlled by ERK activity. And we could either sort of view this as a purely phenomenological description of the tissue, but this dependency of the rest length on ERK can also be derived from a microscopic theory involving 3D, um, 3D surface tensions. So here we have sort of a schematic uh, connecting all of these um, delays and couplings. And the activator inhibitor dynamics is what's giving us oscillations and providing a, a period to the patterns. And through cells sort of being coupled mechanically and pulling on each other, it's allowing a transmission of the signal through space and uh, producing, leading to a wavelength. Okay, and then we find sort of when we simulate this model with all these couplings, we get a good qualitative agreement with data with the correct correlations between density on a so left, on the left is a chymograph of the confluent phase, and on, on the right-hand side, a simulated chymograph. Um, but we, have, we know that this, well, we have results that the period, the wavelength, and delays are determined by the three timescales in the problem, so the delays in the circuit. So we can try to um, put this on a more sort of quantitative footing if we can estimate these, these uh, timescales, which are all, uh, by the way, macroscopic parameters. So the ideal experiments to do this um, would be to sort of separately perturb the mechanical and chemical halves of the system. And so our collaborators have done this. So on the, on the first, um, if we start with uh, sort of relaxed cells and we stretch cells and observe how uh, ERK increases, we can fit this and extract on the right a, a time scale for ERK activation. Conversely, if we activate, optogenetically activate ERK in a half plane and observe the displacement of cells, we can fit this and extract these mecha mechanical timescales. And sort of combining these estimates gives us a, a parameter-free estimate uh, prediction of the wavelength and period of the patterns, which seems to match very well closely to observations and data for MDCK. Yeah, so here we've got sort of, um, not only have we sort of have produce very nice bits of the data, we get this quantitative prediction. <clears throat> and all of this is suggesting that, in fact, these patterns can arise from a, a scalar instability um, and, and are not driven by, with a coupling between ERK and rest length, a sort of chem mechanochemical coupling, rather than being driven by um, active migration forces. Well, <clears throat> we still need to understand uh, why waves are unidirectional in migrating tissues. And we suspect here that maybe um, cell migration might, might play a role. Mm. Yeah, so our collaborators have, have, have been able to uh, measure the polar polarization in cells um, by the position of the Golgi body um, relative to the nucleus. And they find that as the experiment goes on and waves propagate from the uh, boundary to, to inside the tissue, cells become increasingly polarized deeper and deeper inside the bulk. So then we can sort of form a hypothesis that um, the these patterns are sort of arising from an isotropic uh, in sort of instability and a, a scalar instability involving this feedback loop that we just discussed. Um, but the feedback between the waves and polar migration force is, is required to direct the waves. So next, we, we to study this, we uh, try to incorporate polarization into the model. And we come up with the simplest couplings that are supported by data. And this is the cells polarize against gradients of stress. So this just means if I, I pull what more on one side of the cell and on the other, the cell polarizes in the opposite direction. And then um, the cell sort of produces active uh, migration forces to propel itself, propel itself in the direction of this polarization. Uh, well, this still leaves a further problem. And this is uh, how can cells sense direction from symmetric waves? And this might be familiar with people in, from Dixostillium. Uh, so here I've, I've plotted a wave representing uh, the gradients of gradients of stress, which the polar um, cells are polarizing in response to. And if we're, um, if we're sent reading from this wave, we're spending sort of equal amounts of time reading from these positive gradients as we are from these negative gradients. So the sum, the sum of these two contributions uh, would be zero. But we have, we have two, two waves, a mechanical one and a chemical one. 
And we know that interference between two waves can break symmetry. And this can happen so if, for instance, we have a non-linearity where Erkin is inhibiting the stress polarity coupling. And I'd, I'd be happy to discuss evidence for this further. So here I've, I've, I've drawn ERK in yellow, and everywhere that ERK is high, stress polarity coupling is low, and everywhere that ERK is low, stress polarity coupling is high. And this gives us a sort of square wave nonlinearity. And when we multiply that um, by our stress, uh, we find that we break symmetry. And the, the degree of symmetry breaking uh, is controlled by, by the phase differences between these two waves. And now if I sort of remind you of this, this circuit that we had, these, um, the phase difference is controlled by these, these timescales and these delays. So it should in principle be possible to tune these timescales um, to, to sort of cause maximal symmetry breaking and sort of gain maximum in information from the wave. Um, so this leads us to why do cells always polarize against the waves? And to investigate this, um, we simulated our model uh, with different applied ERK waves. So we would apply an ERK wave of different periods and uh, wavelengths. And this is plotted here on the right with red regions corresponding to polarization against the wave and blue regions corresponding to polarization in the opposite um, so-called wrong direction. And what we find is that the, um, the waves permissible by the instability uh, the scalar instability all lie on this, are described by this black curve. And this black curve always lies within this region where cells polarize against ERK waves. So this is a very robust mechanism for generating polarization in a desired direction. Um, what's more, when we sort of plot on this diagram reported values from different systems, and this is including sort of in vivo in mouse and different MVCK lines, uh, we find that these all fall within this sort of um, red region, which suggests that these systems might be tuned for sort of gaining optimal information and optimal uh, polarization in response to the waves. Well, this was sort of looking at um, an av average uh, polarization. We also need to simulate the full model. And when we do this again, uh, with sort of leader cells on the left, we find that waves propagate um, away, from the, away from the edge uh, in the desired direction. So here we have, um, just to recap, we sort of described um, this, these disorders, isotropic waves in the, the confluent phase. And we've also now come up with a sort of an ex, uh, a model for these um, directed waves in migrating tissue. And a sort of key, high, a key prediction that sh which would connect these two uh, cases is that if we can lower the stress polarity coupling, this should destroy directionality even in migrating tissues, so and then we'd sort of return in migrating cells to, to these disordered, uh, disordered patterns. And so our collaborators um, sort of found that they could use Merlin, which is reported to uh, modulate cell polarization in response to mechanical stress, which is sort of exactly our coupling in the model. And they created some knockouts to test this prediction. And when they do this, and I hope you can, the, the, the movies are playing uh, smoothly enough. We see that in the wild type, um, as, as we'd expect, as we've already observed, the, um, the waves propagate away from the migrating edge. And as the, as the migration continues, these waves propagate further and further. Whereas in the Merlin knockout, it sort of matches our prediction. Um, there's no polar, there should be no polarization. We see these disordered isotropic waves, which is what we also saw in the confluent phase. So this sort of supports our hypothesis that um, a coupling of polar polarization is not required for the spatial temporal patterns to occur, but is required for them to orient unidirectionally. So again, I'm not sure if the movies are playing entirely smoothly, so I just included chymographs of both the wild type and the Merlin case, uh, Merlin case so you can see the disordered patterns more clearly. So in, in conclusion, um, so we found that um, the isotropic waves can arise through a, a be explained by a scalar instability involving a sort of activ activator inhibitor dynamics between ERK activity and, and cell length. And this provides uh, quantitative predictions which agree with data both in the confluent and migratory case. On the other hand, polarity is required, uh, polarity and active migration for symmetry breaking and the establishment of directional waves seen in migrating tissues. Uh, finally, this mechanism seems to be very robust for polarizing cells towards free edges. 
and these uh, sort of real data seem to lie um, in this region, which is close to optimal for extracting information from the waves. Uh, so finally, for the acknowledgements, I'd like to acknowledge again our collaborators uh, who did all the experiments, Noya, Hino, and Tsuyoshi Hiroshima. Natalia here and Eduardo IS2 also worked on the analysis in theory. Xavier Trepat and um, Michiyuki Matsuda, who've uh, provided sort of, uh, help with experiments and use of facility, and everyone in the Hineso group uh, for feedback on the work. Uh, so finally, I can point you towards um, a couple of publications that have just come out, one in development and cell, which goes into much more detail uh, on the on sort of experimentally on how mechanical and chemical waves can uh, direct cell polarization, and also sort of the work, uh, an article describing more in more detail what I've just discussed is currently available on bio, bio archive. Uh, finally, I thank the, uh, the funding that we've received. Okay, so thank you. Thanks very much. much. Ready, uh, give a clap. everyone. Um, so I, again, just wanted to start out with a quick question of my own. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, is there is there some kind of threshold for activation, you know, a certain amount that the cells need to be initially stretched by or a certain degree of ERK activation that the cells initially need to sort of get this process started? Um, yeah, so we, we haven't actually sort of tested with very small perturbations. But in, in wild type, I think you're looking at sort of five to 10% stretch. And actually on my- Not a lot. No, um, or, or sort of area change can, can do it. Okay, thank um, you. It's okay. A question from uh, Robert Insull, who's asking if you, or I guess your collaborators have ever tried gently flowing medium over the MDCK monolayers to exclude a role for a diffusive signal. Um, is this would this be a diffusive signal of ERC? Uh, I guess. I guess any I guess diffusive so. signal that would. Okay. I don't know if Rob wants to jump in. If you're there yeah, it's you. yeah. Your data are completely convincing that there's a mechanical coupling, mm -hmm. um, but it just looks so like um, diffusible systems like dictyostelium or Belousov Sadovskinsky reactions mm -hmm. that I wonder if there is also any kind of diffusible signal going. And it would be so easy and beautiful to tell you would just need to flow medium slowly over the um, experiment and that would remove all diffusible signals while leaving all mechanical signals. Okay yes yeah, so I'm, I'm not actually sure if they perform these experiments. Um, we did we did model this um, so uh, we, we found that if you sort of include this you still get ported to the uh, sort of diffusion sort of chem chemical relays. I'm not sure if that's the same thing. Um, you would still get qualitatively the similar, similar behavior, but with a slight shift to the um, wavelength and, and mm -hmm. frequency. Uh, on the other hand, there is sort of this strong evidence that there is a mechanical coupling uh, when you stretch cells. You see a that's right. Yes, that's um, right. But I'm not. But yeah, thank you for the suggestion. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure whether it's been it's been done yet. All right, thanks, Rob, for the question. Uh, Brian Camley is wondering: Is there evidence to support? e.g. ERK inhibiting stress polarity coupling to solve the back of the wave problem versus a bistable memory as seen in dictostelium? Um, yeah, well, so this, so this, so first of all, um, we've sort of systematically explored other couplings, which I can, I can go to in the theory, uh, but it seems like ERK does have a downstream effect on actomyosin, and this is also involved in cell polarization. So it is, could interfere in this way. And also our, our sort of collaborators have done sort of experiments where they find that either activate, sorry, sorry, activating ERK, ERK decreases traction forces and sort of restoring, um, so inhibiting ERK would sort of increase them again. So this was where we were sort of getting the evidence for this. But we, I think we could do more, more tests on this, certainly. Okay, we'll make this question the last one. Um, so from Sandra Iden, uh, concerning the initial stretch experiments, do you maintain ERK waves when epithelial cells are in the strain avoidance mode, uh, orienting perpendicular to the strain direction? 
Um, no, so when when you would sort of, when we stretch the cells in these experiments, we sort of saturate ERK and we don't get any waves. And also we we destroy. Um, if I can go back. Oh, maybe it's too far. We sort of destroy the mechanical coupling, so there's no feedback from ERK onto the mechanical signal. So we wouldn't expect um, expect to see waves in this instance anyway. Thank you. Uh, just there are a few questions that we didn't get to, so if you want to address them in the chat, you're more than welcome to, Daniel. Okay, thanks very much. Great, thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you. And um, also, we're um, we're happy to have continued discussion in the Slack channel after um, after this ends. All right, so uh, Suda, you can go ahead and start sharing. Great, thanks. All right, so next up and last, uh, but not least, we have Suda Kumari, and she's a postdoc at MIT in the Irvine lab, and she studies the role of lymphocyte cytoskeleton in migration and immune responses. Um, go ahead and take it away, thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> so I'll also start by thanking you guys for putting this wonderful platform together, for sharing up ideas and science and we have heard so many fascinating talks here, so thanks a lot. So I'm going to talk about how a subset of immune cells called lymphocytes organize their cytoskeleton in order to achieve rapid migratory transitions. Uh, so we have heard a lot about immune cells in this seminar series. Okay, yeah. So we've heard a lot about immune cells in the seminar series. And one thing we can all appreciate is that they migrate really, really well. In the case of lymphocytes, they're always on the go, restlessly migrating, aggressively migrating, looking for the presence of the signatures of infection and diseases called antigens. And once in a while, it will happen that a lymphocyte would actually find antigen displayed on antigen presenting cell. And this lead to immediate deacceleration and arrest of uh, the T cell, the lymphocyte T cell, uh, leading up to formation of a specialized cell-cell conjugate interface called immunological synapse. And there is crucial transformation of uh, transfer of uh, biochemical and biophysical information across the immunological synapse. Uh, the synapse is a radially symmetrical structure where the aspect ratio is on an average close to one. Of course, that has to break when the T cell will polarize and migrate on to perform its effective functions. Now it's known that the duration of the synapse is a critical determinant of effector functions and uh, subsequent differentiation program. But what is not known is what regulates it. And this is a question that we want to tackle. But let's say there are no chemokines in the, in the media. There's no chemical motivation for the T cell to arrest or move on. What the T cell intrinsic mechanisms that sustain the symmetry of the synapse, thereby stabilizing the synapse, and especially so since T cells by themselves are highly migratory in nature, so a sustained synapse. So we argued that we can understand that by simply looking at synapse and changes it undergoes when it breaks symmetry. And probably by looking at that, we'll be able to understand what the mechanism that sustain it. So to image synapse, we use this platform called antigen presenting surface, which is basically a planar surrogate for antigen presenting cell. It has molecules derived from antigen presenting cells, such as I integrin ICAM1, as well as agonist antigen. And these two signals are sufficient to instigate synapse formation, as well as they recapitulate some basic tenets of uh, synapse breaking. So what is sustaining synapse? Uh, of course, since there's an integrin involved, that is a primary suspect, that perhaps the activation of integrins that is sustaining uh, the synapse of a highly migratory T cell. So which I decided to test that. And we used uh, naive T cells from mice, cells that have never seen antigens before in their life, drop them on antigen presenting surface, and surely enough, they form beautiful radially symmetric uh, synapses within five minutes of initial feeding. And between, uh, after about 20 minutes, they start to break symmetry. And when we activate integrin, it is not able to stop symmetry breaking. Or if you inactivate LFA and ICAM interaction, symmetry breaking is not, uh, uh, is not promoted, indicating that integrin activation by itself is surprisingly not sufficient to sustain synapse. There are other uh, players involved. 
And the next aspect was actin cytoskeleton because we could see changes in actin cytoskeleton when symmetry was breaking at 20 minutes. So to gain insight on into whether actin cytoskeleton organization is important for uh, sustaining symmetry or breaking symmetry, we followed uh, actin organization in uh, naive T cells with a single synapse in time. So this is a stable synapse. And for the cell is my highly dynamic. There are attempts to break symmetry. Uh, but the cell desymmetrizes and eventually will break symmetry. And there'll be some interesting changes in the cytoskeletal organization. I'll replay it for you. What happens in the stable synapse is that there are these dot like structures that continue to form and dissipate in the context of the synapse. But when the cell is breaking symmetry, these dot like structures are permanently lost. And these structures we call actin foci. You can quantify this behavior where there is increase in aspect ratio, the transition into uh, this breaking of symmetry, and there is permanent loss of actin foci. So what are these actin foci? We actually characterized them previously in our eLife paper. These are generated by viscotelic syndrome protein VASP and R23, and they are sustained by continual nucleation of filaments at localized sites. Cells that do not have VASP do not form foci, such as T cells from VAS patients and also from VAS knockout mice. These cells do form synapse. They beautifully adhere to APS. However, if you follow them in time, they are predisposed to symmetry breaking. So there seems to be a strong correlation between presence of actin foci and uh, good symmetry. So the next we wondered, uh, is it that foci are actually mediating symmetry in some way? And if that is the case, how might that be? How would these structures actually help in symmetry and therefore synapse stability? So to gain insights into that, we decided to look a little closer to the, uh, at the uh, T cell synapse. And this is a single T cell synapse uh, followed in time. And one thing that is immediately obvious is that there are at least two types of affecting behaviors at synapse. I'll play it again for you. There's this peripheral lamellar protrusion and detractions that we call fluctuation. And there are the actin foci in the context of synapse that also continue to form and go away. It's more obvious if you look at the, if you can extract the foci and put them together with the total affectin uh, on a thymograph. So there are peripheral lamellar fluctuations and these are the foci that stay put in the context of the synapse. Of course, the cells that do not have foci, they're the lamellar fluctuations dominate and the foci are typically uh, absent. If you compare the lifetime of the foci with the lamellar fluctuations, then what we find is that the foci are much longer lived than the lamellar protrusions and detractions. That has very interesting implications. So these implications are that if the foci are longer lived than lamellar fluctuations, then the bond line lifetime of receptors at the foci site will be longer then the bond lifetime of receptors at the lamellar sites, especially so since lamella is continuously undergoing fluctuations. Other indication is that the fact you can see the foci in the context of lamellar affectin, there are more filaments there. Uh, and we measured this higher nucleation by using uh, barbed and labeling assay. So more filaments would mean that there is more opportunity for interaction with myosin II. And of course, standing alone, these two attributes do not explain symmetry because you can hire local adhesion and that could in fact be helpful in breaking symmetry. You could have higher nucleation, again, doesn't explain symmetry. So whatever benefit the foci might be bringing to the system, it has to be scaled across the synapse, which kind of makes sense because foci are forming and dissipating all across the synapse, whereas the level of fluctuations are inherently polarized. So to get an integrated idea of how these virtues of differences in foci and uh, lamellar protrusion retractions could actually help in sustaining symmetry. We took advantage of computational simulations. So we patterned a 2D simulation scheme after immunological synapse. There are foci where there's higher nucleation and there is higher adhesion compared to the lamellar sites. Uh, in the natural synapse, there are, of course, uh, lamellar fluctuations that we could not include in the simulation because we do not know the boundary conditions. Uh, and to simulate the cytoskeletal behavior, we use this Brownian dynamic equation with uh, no inertia. It has three force terms. Uh, contractility, that will come from myosin activity, 
drag that comes from the adhesion and thermal uh, term which is similar between the foci and lamella. Using this equation, we then simulated the synapse. Uh, <coughs> we basically used, so shown here are the sort of important players in this simulation scheme, but there are a number of other parameters that uh, players that can be uh, sort of, we have a paper in AMBO uh, on this uh, project. And uh, if you want to have a closer look, you can uh, refer to it. Um, so basically this is a single T cell synapse. And these are the sites where the foci would be. Uh, more filaments, therefore more myosin there. And as the synapse matures, and myosin starts to walk, develop this amazingly tensile architecture, which holds amazing amount of tension within it, which will be very uh, hard to break, even if there were lamellar fluctuations in the periphery. So I'll play it again for you. So there is huge amount of cytoskeletal tension that develops when myosin walks in this uh, system. And if you take away wasp, then this whole system collapses. There is immediate reduction in cytoskeletal tension and the system becomes amenable to symmetry breaking. And this is what we see experimentally also, that the cells that, that are breaking symmetry, they downregulate wasp. If you take wasp knockout synapse, then all the players are there except for the foci sites. Those sites are not there. So then when myosin walks, the system is actually very lamella-like. So cytoskeletal tension, whatever is there, is now patterned after lamella. And if you remember, lamella undergoes fluctuations constantly. So any of those productive fluctuations could drive symmetry breaking in this system. So this system is highly amenable to symmetry breaking. And that's what we see uh, experimentally. We also confirmed the cytoskeletal tension was no synapse, and we found that it was uh, indeed low. Uh, we used an uh, endogenous uh, cytoskeletal tension sensor. And we found that there was lesser tension in Vasnokot synapse. And also Vasnokot cells had lower tractions on the synapses. In fact, you could even visualize some of these structures that were predicted by the simulation. So there were foci and they were interconnected in structures in a cell that was poised to break synapse. And these structures were not seen when the cell broke synapse. Uh, similarly, we could see them ultrastructurally using uh, platelet Rapnica scanning uh, microscopy, where there was a dense meshwork of uh, filaments in the, in the context of synapse in the normal wild type cells. Uh, and the foci like sites are uh, identified in arrows here. Whereas in vast knockout cells, the network was much more sparse. And sometimes you could even see the uh, lamellar wave like structures that. We don't know what they are. But this structure could be uh, visualized ultrastructurally. So putting together, uh, this is what we think is happening, basically, that when the high highly migrated naive T cell sees the antigenic surface, it builds up a cytoskeletal architecture, uh, which holds uh, in a huge amount of um, uh, in-plane cytoskeletal tension, which cannot be readily broken by lamellar fluctuation and the synapses stabilize. When WASP is reduced in cells that are sufficiently activated or WASP is missing, such as in wild, uh, WASP knockout T cells, then the synapse becomes readily amenable to uh, breaking its symmetry. Of course, this model depends on the fact that the tension has to be distributed across synapse, and we tested that too, using a, a photosensitive form of blebistatin, azidoblebistatin, that can be that can be cross-linked to actin in a, a spatially controlled banner using UV light. And indeed, in azidoblebistatin treated case, when UV light is shown, there is temporary fluctuation in center of mass of synapse, which is not seen in the control cells where the synapse remains stable. So together, uh, uh, we've identified this uh, pathway that is developed by T cells uh, to sustain their synapse, to basically control the duration of their synapse uh, and prevent symmetry breaking for optimal immune response. Of course, this system is still evolving. Like uh, We still do not know many uh, answers to a lot of outstanding questions. And I, look, uh, I would love to hear your thoughts, ideas, and questions about it. With that, I would like to close and thank everyone involved, Daryl, uh, my mentor, and everyone in the Delaware Laboratory for help and support. 
and Michael for simulations, Rife for um, vast patient samples, and also Jan and Mike, big thanks to them for a lot of really useful reagents. And of course, uh, fellowships for many. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you, all of you for your attention. Thanks very much. So maybe I can start with a yeah, go ahead, question Adam. for me. Um, so you showed at the beginning that the that the, um, the attachment was. Oh, I'm hearing someone's microphone on. Okay, just me. Um, so I, uh, at the beginning, you talked about how um, the the um, stabilization. Of the synapse wasn't due to the focal adhesion. So if you if you knock down, do you see any effect on the site of the focal adhesion? Do you see any effects on the foci network, or are they totally unrelated in terms that's of the site That's, a, that's a great question. Yeah. So I've not knocked down focal adhesions. Like I've not done any tile manipulations, but we have looked at the integrin organization, uh, both at the cellular level as well as uh, at the the final level, and we have also looked at tile recruitment distribution. And that doesn't seem to correlate with the symmetry sustainment. So vast knockouts, for example, that break symmetry, they're quite okay in integrin activation as well as telling recruitment and distribution. So, so I, I do think focal additions are important, but they're also important for symmetry breaking. So standing alone, they don't explain the symmetry. Thanks. Uh, we have a question from um, Akanshi. Uh, first, uh, they say, great talk. Um, so the question is, this may be a naive thought, but is there a role of actin foci and the interconnected meshwork in the nucleus immobilization and pliability? Great question. So um, not we have not tested that, but there is a report where uh, Actually, there are, there are research groups who have, uh, who have hypothesized that VASP uh, based actin polymerization does function in uh, nuclear shape. And they, in fact, uh, the idea was that there's a nuclear actin pool that is doing that. So not necessarily via foci, uh, but it's an interesting idea because you are basically sustaining a certain kind of cell shape. So I would think that it would have effect on the nuclear morphology overall, even via just stabilizing synapse. We are not tested that yet. Uh, we have a question from Andrea who says, thanks to the talk. Uh, which endogenous uh, cytoskeletal tension sensor did you use? Oh, uh, so it's basically a lymphocytic form of P130 CAS. Um, it's called CAS-L. Um, and this protein basically has uh, N-terminal disorder domain, which opens up in response to cytoskeletal tension. And that domain then exposes phosphor, sorry, tyrosines that get phosphorylated by sarcinogen. So we just looked at phosphocas L and we found that it was localized to foci and the levels of phosphocas L went down uh, when foci were missing. Emily Richardson says, thanks for the great talk and asks, are the foci anything like invadosomes or are they completely unrelated? This is a fantastic question. I think they, so they, they do have a lot of similarities to invadosomes. Um, so in our system, because of myosin-based lateral tension, uh, we find that the forces are distributed in plane. But uh, if you look at very early synapse, the foci sites could essentially invade into the, but they have a Z aspect to them. So they could protrude um, because the force is not dissipated in plane. So they do have a uh, resemblance in, in that sense. One thing that I forgot to mention is that in this system, the foci are developed at uh, T cell receptor clusters. Um, so in that sense, they are slightly different from invadosomes that there's a requirement for T cell receptor engagement and, um, and signaling for the foci to develop. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Manjanath Javu. Uh, what causes the disintegration of actin foci? Any signaling molecules known to be specific to symmetry breaking? Uh, that's a fantastic question. So I I really don't know. I've been trying to find that out. So what could be the reason? What what dictates the lifetime of a individual actin foci? If you plot it, it doesn't look like a Gaussian. 
look at population of extinct foci. It seems like there's an active process that's taking them away, but we do not currently know what could that be. What's, uh, yeah. All right, we have a question from Alessandra Kambi who asks, is the formation of foci depending on integrant engagement, are there formins involved? So the formins don't seem to be involved because if we use SMF, uh, SMI FH2, then the foci actually do not go away. In fact, they increase in both intensity and number, uh, which is probably because there is a shading of monomers between formin-based and apophysis methods. Uh, and the, regarding the involvement of integrins, so uh, it, we take uh, antigen presenting surfaces where there are no integrins, the foci still form, um, but they look qualitatively different. And one explanation for that is this is a nice paper from Landscape's lab that there is a crosstalk between integrin based and T cell receptor based acting network. And integrins do shape the foci, but they do so by dissipation. So they take away the filaments away from the um, from the foci. So there is influence of integrins on foci, but they don't necessarily strengthen them rather. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna make this the last question. And if anyone hasn't had their question answered to any of the speakers today, we're gonna put them on Slack. So please do head over there. Um, so the last question is from Joe Tyler who asks, uh, do you think these foci are related to the F-actin puncture seen during phagocytosis or at the rear of the lamellopodia of some migrating cells? They're related, I think, because up to three dependent structures. Uh, but what is activating the up to three? So in this case, it's WASP. Um, I heard Mira Krendel's talk in a different platform the other day, and she was describing puncte, beautiful puncte, WASP dependent. So, um, I don't know, so I think there could be differences in the way you are activating WASP. So in this case, it seems it's CDC42 independent, which is very surprising. That could be one of the differences uh, between these systems. But morphologically, they're similar. I do not know about the dynamics, uh, lifetime of the phagocytic puncti or the, or the, uh, the rear uh, uh, structures, yeah. But uh, in terms of the molecular players involved, there are a number of similarities uh, between these structures. Thank you very much, Suda. Um, so I think we'll post the Slack channel on YouTube and Zoom before.